Sure. She's an amazing young lady. She's watching her perform. I was trying to think of what we were doing at 15. 15 yeah. She's performing at the Hollywood Bowl. I had a Betty Grable hand puppet talking to it when I was 15. <laughs> Wasn't all bad. Um, my next guest is someone I've admired. I just met him backstage. He's the uh, founder of Monty Python, and he's uh, been here performing around the country, performing a kind of comedic lecture. And he's going to have a special airing on Cinemax this month, starting Friday night. Would you welcome Graham Chapman? Graham. <laughs> No better spot for performers than following talented youngsters, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing when you were 15? Uh, I suppose I was uh, taking the first initial steps to towards becoming a doctor. Yeah. yeah. Now, that's what were you yeah. really going to do? That's what I did as well. Yeah. well I didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh -huh. How do you get from being a doctor and, and go well, to Monty I, uh, Python? I helped to uh, earn a little extra cash by uh, performing in cabarets and that sort of thing, nightclubs. Yeah. and. Uh, also writing for television, and that gradually took over. And yeah. So I uh, came to the point where, uh, at the end of, uh, after I'd qualified, I had an offer to go off and write a movie on an island in uh, the Mediterranean, so I took that rather than ear, nose, and throat. Yeah, I know. See, <laughs> knowing how you guys work, I never know when I'm being put on. I know Jonathan Miller was a, was a doctor, yes, right? Yes, that's true. And yeah. went into show business, but that's unusual. Well, yeah. But why not? It's more fun. It's been interesting, certainly. Yeah. yeah. More, uh, more varied than the nasal and... Uh, of course. Yeah, more various. boring. Uh, I love the Monty Python shows. They showed up here for a long time. Um, you haven't done any of those shows for a while. Did the group all break up? I see Cleese doing, John Cleese doing a few commercials. We've kind of broken up and we haven't, really. Uh, I mean, uh, I believe they've just formed a company. I've been away uh, working here. Right. Uh, but I believe they've just formed a company called uh, Prominent Features with the idea of uh, kind of giving credibility to various individual members' film projects. Right. Uh, but I have to find out more about that when I get back. They haven't told me a thing yet. You don't hear, you don't keep in touch? Uh, well, I do. I mean, it, for instance, uh, talking about uh, maybe doing another Python movie, the last time I spoke to John Cleese, which was a couple of weeks ago, right. he said, well, maybe when we're all about 50, which isn't long in his case, uh, <laughs> or mine, for that matter. So we'll see. We'll see. What was the one that, 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 that you did that really got kind of condemned? You had trouble with the uh, sort of... Um, Life of Brian. The Life of Brian. Yes, yes. You had a lot of trouble with that for a while, didn't you? Yes, we did. Mostly for people that hadn't seen it. Yeah. 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 They, were, they felt quite prepared to speak out against it without actually having seen the movie. Uh, which That's actually, usually true, isn't it? Somebody hasn't read a book, but they heard it's pretty bad, so oh. they, they bad mouth before it comes out. Or ban it, yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Now, you're doing... A, a thing, a, a lecture, and some of it has to do with sports. Yes. But not your normal Olympic events. No, not really. Um, shall I sort of begin at the beginning sure. with that one? Because I was, sure. I was sitting uh, writing one day, um, and, uh, or trying to write rather, uh, and uh, I had a phone call from a British newspaper who uh, interrupted wanting to know what I would like to do if I won their million pound bingo competition. Uh, not one of our better newspapers. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I told Probably them, the Sun. I'm that guessing. sort of newspaper, yeah. yes. You're, you're getting very close. <laughs> uh, so I told them that I would give it to John Cleese so that he could take an afternoon off, do you see, being irritated at the time. Uh, they thought that was quite funny, but a bit cruel, and published uh, it in the paper the next day, also adding that I was interested in going to the Andes, because I had mentioned that. I used to climb a little bit. Well, the very next day after this article, I had a call from the chairman of the Dangerous Sports Club, who wondered if I wanted to go hang gliding over active volcanoes in Ecuador. <laughs> I said no, uh, but I was interested in going to Ecuador, and I subsequently met him, chatted, and, and did go with them to Ecuador for a week, uh, only a week, though. I had lots of important meetings I invented so that I wouldn't have to stay longer than that, cutting down the chance of having to do anything particularly dangerous. But I did get to know the group there, and they, they like to do things which are, well, things which scare them a bit, things to which there is an unacceptable risk attached, really. Being on the edge, as they say? Well, they like jumping off bridges on pieces of elastic. And what do they call that, like bungee like, lines or something Bungee like jumping, yes, that's right. Uh, and I got to know this crowd while I was there and what made them tick, really. Very varied group of people, right from, uh, you know, your average out-of-work English person, uh, <laughs> right, right to... Uh, Right to the other extreme, a uh, uh, chap with the unlikely name of, of Hugo Pornsfoot, some sort of second cousin to Queen Elizabeth, I understand, yes. and a uh, bit of inbreeding there, fancy. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> not, not proved at this point, but no, possible. No, possible but yeah. Could be described as a touch loony. Hey, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, anyway, uh, what they have in common, this, this very varied group, is that they, they, they're adrenaline junkies, basically, I suppose. They yeah, like the, to do things which scare them a bit, yeah. The bungee thing I've seen, they jump off something like the George, and they wait till they're about 10 feet from the ground, and the lion is supposed to stop them at that point, and... Usually does. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, um... I, uh, I, after having been with them to Ecuador, I felt a bit guilty that I'd been made a member of this, this club and hadn't actually done anything dangerous. So I did join in their winter sports in St. Moritz uh, a winter sports. year and a half ago, yes. The basic rule for that is that it should be an uncontrolled descent of a snow slope. Uh, that is to say, you have to have something between yourself and the skis, thus making control impossible. And that can be anything from a wheelchair to a grand piano. Uh, you know, kind of get marks for, uh, for invention. There. Okay. Yeah. We're going to take, when we come back, we have a little film that mm. shows some of these uh, particular effects. Oh, that's right, yeah. Effects. Yeah. All right. Let's, we shall be <laughs> right back. <laughs> okay, we're talking to Graham Chapman now. As a lead into this, the lead into these sports, you wanted to explain a little something else? Well, yes, that, that, that particular winter sport event, I, I finished up, uh, I chose the safest looking object to go down the slope in, which happened to be a seven, uh, sort of 15 foot long wooden Venetian gondola on the skis, uh, and found myself sitting next to uh, uh, Hugo Pontsfoot in oh, this, yes. uh, at Hugo the top Pons of the slope. Pontsfoot. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, said helpful things like, looks like a bit of a brown trouser job this afternoon. Ah, uh -huh. I got that. Um, we were then <laughs> pushed off from the top of the slope, and by the, by the second bump, we were airborne. I found myself flying over his head, and then saw Hugo fly over my head, and then we were pursued down the slope by this wretched wooden gondola, which had some <laughs> kick away to, to avoid injury. But I, I felt I was winded, not badly wounded at all, but winded, but I felt great after that, thoroughly elated, full of adrenaline too. And so I did agree to do another event with them, which was a, of a catapulting nature. And this was for charity in Hyde Park. Basically, I was put into a climbing harness, uh, tied behind me to, by a rope to a large concrete block set in the ground. And then this 150-foot crane lowered down some aircraft carrier elastic, very heavy-duty elastic, which was attached to the front of the harness. Then the crane stretched up to its full height. And at that point, the gentleman behind me said, there are one or two things you ought to know. Um, he said, you will be experiencing a force of some 6G, uh, so you'd better put your hands behind your head like that, otherwise you will get whiplash, not mm -hmm. might, but will. And when you get to the top of your flight, uh, you'll notice all these coils of rope floating around. Don't get tangled up in those, otherwise you could strangle yourself I on see. the way down. Let's see. And well, he, shall we better we roll shall, this in? Yes, well, okay. I think we'd better see what Fine. happens with this. Yeah, we can have a little narrative over this. Now, this is, in fact, a, uh, a catapult event. <laughs> Good. That is a person? It's quite a thrill. <laughs> Those are not dummies. These are people? Those are people, yes. This is a bungee jump from a... Hot air balloon. Now, this is the bungee jumpers. Now, they have nothing but a rubber, long rubber band, which... And they do, as you say, get quite close to the ground. Good. <laughs> or water. I don't believe this. This is off the bridge now. This is a jump of some 900 feet. They've gone up. I will not be doing this. No, I... Good choice. <laughs> this is an enormous plastic bubble in which they intend one day to cross the English Channel. <laughs> and this is the early days of bungee jumping, the very first sort of experimental steps. I see, not really too far. <laughs> <laughs> the 
This is a little bit of hang gliding. They thought they ought to practice once. They didn't, don't normally practice because they think it takes the edge off things. But uh, this was before flying off the top of the summit of Kilimanjaro, which is, of course, 19,500 feet. And David Kirk, the chairman of the club, had only flown four times before, so a little bit of practice. But he arrived at the top and uh, decided a uh, terrible takeoff from the top of Kilimanjaro. Just to land somewhere out there in the jungle. Good heaven. Or somewhere rather badly. Oh, bad show. Bad show. Now, this is the winter sports. Now, this... <laughs> and the agony of defeat. Well, what the hell was that, a car? A kind of bath chair. A bathtub. A motorized bathtub. What is that, an outrigger? That's the rowing eight. Yeah, yeah. I see. <laughs> sort of inevitable result. <laughs> and uh, grand piano, of course. <laughs> and why not? Why not, yes. Why not indeed? <laughs> And accompanying him on the piano, right? <laughs> this is weird stuff. <laughs> I'm very disturbed friends, Graham. Yes, they are kind of disturbed. Um, in fact, uh, I'm writing a, um, a full-length adventure movie about them. I think it will be the first adventure movie without special effects or insurance. Yeah, you'll, that, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> 